Better System Trader, episode 100. Welcome to Better System Trader, the podcast to help systematic traders of all levels improve their trading. We'll give you loads of expert tips and practical advice on system design and validation, money management, trading psychology, and many other topics. Whether you're just starting out or a savvy systematic trader, we're here to help you improve your trading and find more success. This is Better System Trader with your host, Andrew Swanscott. Welcome to the Better System Trader podcast. I'm incredibly excited and proud to say this is episode number 100. It's a huge milestone, so thanks for joining us for this special occasion and also for following along the way. I know there are a lot of people out there who have been listening since episode number one, which was over two years ago now, so thanks for all of your support and participation over that time. Looking back, we've been incredibly privileged to have so many awesome guests along the way. We've learned and shared so much, so I'm extremely grateful to be in a position to be able to share this with you. Now, as I mentioned in a few of the most recent episodes, we have something extra special lined up to celebrate this milestone. I'm not going to tell you about it yet, but all will be revealed after the chat with Jack, so strap yourselves in for this one. It goes for about an hour, but it contains loads of little nuggets of wisdom throughout the chat as Jack answers all of your trading questions. Actually, we get to a big chunk of them anyway, so a huge thanks to everyone who submitted questions for Jack. Now, in this episode, we cover a wide range of topics, so I'm not going to go into them right now, but let's just get straight into it for today. But uh, make sure you listen right through to the end because after the chat with Jack, I'll tell you all about the special giveaway we've put together to celebrate episode 100. It is absolutely huge. But first, let's jump over to my second part of the chat with Jack Schwager. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Jack, I might just uh, move on to some audience questions now because I have eight pages of questions here. <laughs> so um, I sent an, an email out to the listeners and asked them if they uh, if they wanted to submit some questions for me to ask you and we got a great response. So um, I don't think we'll get through all of them, but I've uh, hand selected some. So sure. um, we'll start with Stuart. And this, um, this question was uh, quite a popular one, actually. Since writing Market Wizards and New Market Wizards, how have markets changed? And do you think the things that made traders in your book successful then are still valid today? Okay, yeah. So, uh, so there certainly have been some very big changes, right? I mean, uh, back when I wrote uh, Market Wizards, New Market Wizards, in fact, some of the best stories in there had to do with, you know, stories that happened on the trading floor. Uh, I can think of the story of like one that pops in my mind is is like Paul Tudor Jones's worst trade, which is kind of very colorful and dramatic story. But so that happens on the trading floor. I did that interview today. That couldn't. That could no longer. You know, somebody who's uh, started who tries to start trading ten years ago, whatever. That's no longer could be a story because now we have all like electronic trading. The floors are part of the uh, part of the past. So that's a big change. We have gone from from all floor trading to all virtually virtually one hundred percent electronic trading. So that's a big change. Uh, you know, another big change is computers. Uh, you're going from a point in time where where the PC was barely starting to now where there is such immense computer power. And you also have not only not only is the PC itself uh, have tremendous power compared to uh, compared to well like yeah, you know uh, more power than 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 mainframes uh, of the of the of the day of those those earlier books, but you actually have uh, uh, quant quant shops with. Uh, with scores of PhDs, uh, quant PhDs, uh, doing complex mathematical modeling uh, involving thousands or tens of thousands of securities and, and their interactions and uh, immense computing processing power. So, so, so you've gone from virtually no computers, I'm or computers in a very simplistic fashion, you know, yeah, you could, you know, trend following models, you know, on computers, stuff like that. But you now have that, that change world where, where, where the quant Ability both by the people participating as well as the power of computers has has is dramatically different. So those are big changes, but uh, the heart of the matter is that the, how much of the markets really changed in terms of uh, how they behave and all of that, and and what and and what what makes for good and bad trading habits and what what's important for success and what are the causes of failure and all of those real important questions to traders. Now, the best way I can answer that is to 
actually use uh, uh, an anecdote, which, which was my own reaction. Um, and let me uh, uh, set the scene here. A little over a year ago, um, well, I had I had gotten the, my agent got the rights to uh, back for me for a New Market Wizards, the second of the Wizards book, uh, and I had the audio rights to it. And it was the only Market Wizard book that did not have a narration to it. Uh, because the other books, the pro, the publishers had had done audible books, uh, got narrators. So I had the uh, the uh, opportunity to choose my own narrator and stuff like that. And I did that. I found that someone who was absolutely terrific. It is an it is, in fact, I think the best, by far the best narration of any of my books. Um, so I had also, in doing that, I was listening to my own book uh, 25 plus years after I wrote it. One concern I had was this is a this is a conversion from uh, written word to audio. So it's a, a straight conversion, mm. but there's no opportunity really. You don't, you don't rewrite stuff for an audio version. And my concern was, well, what, we, you know, so many things have changed in 25 years. What if the... What if what I wrote 25 years ago is really not right now? It's kind of odd uh, to have this now um, uh, crystallized in, term, in an, a new audio release. So, I, I, but I did have to, in the process of producing this uh, this uh, audio version, listen to the entire book, uh, which was kind of a privilege because I heard a great narrator reading it. That was fun, but also I was listening to it. Well, what what might not be accurate anymore? And to my relief, there was nothing really, almost virtually almost zero. That was in that book that pertained to trading advice or trading insights or uh, trading rules or anything like that, that was was no longer – that was inaccurate. It was all still valid. In fact, when I got through this process, the only thing I said to myself, you know, there's one thing I might change if I was doing it today is at one point in the book – and this was me talking, not one of the traders, but I was kind of – uh, making the point about risk management. And I said, uh, you know, uh, one of the things to learn about this from this uh, interview and learn about trading is that you don't want to risk too much on a trade. And basically, you should limit the risk on any trade to 1% to 2%. Well, uh, there was nothing – that is actually – that wasn't what was wrong. It's just that I, was, I felt I wasn't conservative enough. If I was writing it today, I, I would have said less than 1%. But that was the one thing – that I had that I said, well, I might have made it a little different. So the interesting thing is even though I'm listening to this book 25 years later, there's really nothing about trading that I would have changed, which to me says that as much as the markets have changed, they're still in a very meaningful way the same. Yeah, I think actually that's a quote from one of your books. Uh, markets are always changing and they always stay the same. So I think – Yeah, uh, in fact, that, that's <laughs> a paraphrase. I, uh, Ed Sakota, I think, said that. Ah, okay. Uh, and uh, and I'm paraphrasing him on that. Yeah. Yep. Okay, thanks. Well, we've got a question from Shane on Ed, actually. So uh, Shane would like to know, um, you mentioned in your first Market Wizard book that you adopted Ed as a mentor of sorts. Can you talk about the lessons you learned from Ed and how that has changed your trading over the years? Yeah, well, I, I wouldn't say, uh, you know, Ed was not a mentor. Actually, the, the, the only mentor I really had in my life was someone who wasn't in Market Wizards, uh, it was a, uh, a fellow I worked with uh, named Steve Kronowitz, who was a, when I was a research director, uh, he was a technical analyst. And uh, from him, uh, I, you know, at that, that when I was got, first got into the business, coming from an economics background, an Ivy League school, I sort of had a natural bias against believing in technical analysis. But I noticed that Steve was the one analyst I had working for me who was who tended to be right more often than wrong. <laughs> And uh, that led me to talk to him. And he was also a friend. Uh, we worked in the same office and stuff like that. So uh, through him, I kind of uh, learned technical analysis and uh, I kind of understood why it does work. And um, and I began – and I also got uh, – I also learned – one thing that very appealed to me for technical analysis in the very beginning was that with technical analysis, risk management is – uh, works very, very well with technical analysis. Um, most technical approaches are going to be trend. Are, you could try to be. You're going most of the, with the trend or whatever. Uh, so if it's if it if it's if you, if it starts failing, you're if you're true to a technical approach, you'll be getting out of the trade. So your risk management works with it. And in, in fundamental analysis, it's exactly the opposite. The more something goes against you, the facts haven't changed. The more your your approach says you should add. So it's kind of lethal uh, from a money management standpoint. But uh, that's so that was another thing I learned uh, in that process. So he was the only true mentor. 
Uh, of course, from doing the wizard interviews through four books of those interviews, uh, I, I learned something from from just you know most of the most of the traders I interviewed, uh, and Ed had you know, Ed had you know valuable advice, and what I felt was valuable is in that book. So, uh, but I wouldn't say he was a mentor. Okay, well, uh, going a bit further, then a question from Jens. Um, Jens would like to know what could be dangerous to assume that is still valid or present these days. Um, for example, one candidate of mine would be simplicity. For example, some systems are based on simple moving average techniques, which do not work in uh, any more in a robust way. So uh, are there any uh, things in, in those books or stuff that you've learned in the past that is a dangerous assumption to uh, expect it's still valid these days? Um, no, I, I think the if you read the books carefully, the advice is basically, I mean, and you have to, I think every reader and trader has to kind of, Pick who's you know, not every trader's advice is going to resonate, and you have to kind of find what 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 works for you. And I, I, I I've noticed over the years when people say, "Oh, I loved your books," you know, you know, who my favorite trader was. The answer is I have no idea because every time the answer, the people, the person who says that, you know, posing the question to answer it themselves, comes up with a name that's different. So it, it's not like everybody says, you know, one name. Everybody has a different name they come up with because they find some trader really speaks to them. Uh, so I, I don't think that uh, if you read the books in that sense, I, I don't think that the, the advice is misleading at all. Um, and I would also go further. I would say that the advice that are in those books is never of the type of – you know, use a uh, use this type of uh, moving average. It's going to, you know, it's a good way to make money. Um, in fact, I, that's something I try to avoid because those are the types of things that don't have. Are, those are not tr truths or things that last. Uh, those are not really solid, long lasting truths about trading or trading advice. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an example of a of a something that might have you know. A system might work one time, doesn't work another. Uh, but good traders have to be able to adapt and to evaluate what's working and to adapt if it's not working. Hmm. Yep. Okay, I've got a question here from Desmond. Actually, it's a two-part question. Um, so I'll ask you both parts. What, propor sure. what proportion of those traders you interviewed in your first book are still successful today? And are there any statistics to show the long-term sustainability of discretionary versus systematic traders? Okay, so first of all, keep in mind the first Market Wizard book was written in uh, in eight, 1988. Uh, so uh, first of all, not all the people I interviewed are even alive, you know. Yeah. Uh, 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 and uh, certainly, you know, some you know retired, and and you know, and not a, and, and a lot of the people I interviewed were private people. So uh, you, you would not. Uh, People would not know these names at all were they not in the book. They're not people who are managing other people's money or anything like that. So there are no official records to know. So if you if you take some high visibility people like uh, you know like a, a Stanley Druckenmiller or somebody like that, where you know he, he continued to run funds for like plus thirty years and he had like a thirty percent average return, so you kind of know what happened. But a lot of these people, you don't have those records. You don't know. So the truth is, I, I honestly don't know. There. Uh, those numbers are not available, nor did I ever go back and try to uh, to uh, find those numbers because I knew it, they weren't available. And uh, uh, I, I just, if I don't know, I don't have the information or the data to answer the question. Now, as far as discretionary versus uh, systematic, um, all I can tell you is that I've interviewed lots of traders who are purely discretionary, did extremely well. Uh, lots of traders who are purely systematic did extremely well. Um, so that's, again, a matter of personal choice. It's you have to figure out what kind of trader you are. It's uh, I would never say somebody should be a discretionary or a systematic. In fact, in my own life, I have gone from from being a discretionary fundamental without, as a losing trader, I would add, uh, to being a discretionary technical, to being systematic technical, to being discretionary technical. Uh, so, and that just varied with what I was comfortable with and what I gravitated to. So, um, you just have to figure that out. Uh, there is no single right answer. It, it really depends on on the person. So, we have a question here from Christoph. What are the most important psychological or soft factors to become and remain a successful trader, and why? The most important psychological elements. Um, well, there's there's tons of them. Um, 
I, I think my, my market wizard books are more about psychology than they are about trading. Uh, so there are just a, just a few thoughts. I, I don't, you could spend the whole, the whole, uh, podcast on just this one question, yeah. but just to give you a sample, uh, well, Bill Eckhart is one trader sort of mentioned, uh, um, uh, don't do the comfortable thing. Uh, he says markets, uh, markets pay off for doing the uncomfortable thing. And his point was that, that we as humans have evolved to always see comfort and, and that natural tendency means, and he, he draws a conclusion, therefore, that that trade that people will actually do, they do what their in, their instincts lead them to do before they get enough experience and discipline. They will actually do worse than random. And and to be clear here, uh, he's not saying that people won't do better than the monkey throwing darts. Uh, Bill is actually saying that people will do worse than the monkey because the monkey at least will get random results. He's saying that our natural instincts are so poorly attuned to trading because we want to see comfort that we will do worse than uh, than random. In fact, we talked about an aspect of this uh, earlier, the the tendency to go back and to over-optimize systems in the past that they look really good is a, is a, a demonstration of uh, that type of tendency, the the uh, the, uh, the the desire to see comfort. And again, it's just an example of how that desire leads you wrong. So that's one uh, one example of a psychological aspect. Uh, there there are tons of you know, like I say, there there's just so many. It's all about it's almost all about psychology. And uh, uh, you know, like I say, I don't want to take the whole podcast on just the one question. But that's I gave you one example though. Yeah, I think uh, for me, one of the um, the biggest lessons I learned or biggest insights I got from the Market Wizard books was that they all had um, you know, different kind of approaches and some of them even contradicted each other, but they, they kind of seemed to make it work. And I think the, the underlying thing there is that they've found something that works that, uh, for them and matches their, their personality and, and their psychology, uh, which I think is a, a very big struggle for traders, especially those that are kind of beginning and they're trying to find their way. So do you have any advice for, for beginners in trying to find a, a trading approach that uh, could fit them? Yeah, and I'm actually, you, you you made that point perfectly. And, and I give talks, I give a lot, you know, I've given t- hundreds of talks on, on you know, the lessons of the market wizards. And after telling people what's not important, the very, very first thing I tell them is important is exactly what you said. You have to find an approach that fits your personality. And I get across to them how how different, how traders I interviewed, uh, let's say two traders I interviewed as an example, I take two traders as an example, who are 100% diametrically opposed in their opinions about what works and doesn't work, and yet they're both very successful. So yeah. it's it's exactly that point. So it's not about finding a specific methodology. It's about finding a specific methodology that fits a person's personality. And there is no shortcut to that. How do you do it? Well, you know, if somebody coming into if somebody's new to markets, you always begin by reading, uh, getting some knowledge. And then observing markets and then trying to kind of figure out what, what you're, when you're reading, what feels comfortable when you observe markets, what feels comfortable, what doesn't. You just kind of have to discover that and then trying to develop some sort of methodology that utilizes those things that, that to you seem to make sense and seem to work. And, uh, and then going from there, assuming it's a new trader, uh, trying it on paper. And again, paper trading is not, is not like real trading because there's no emotions there, but if it's not going to work on paper, it's certainly not going to work in real life. But but once that works, and once you have a specific methodology, and you've you've gotten to the point where you understand risk management and have a risk plan, all of that, you can try it in the, in the real markets. It's a discovery process. There is no single right answer for anybody. Everybody has to kind of figure it out on their own. And I use the analogy. Um, I've used the analogy in the past where uh, people people have in fact emailed me. So I'm I'm a new trader. What should I do? Technical? Should I do fundamental? What should I do? And I'm saying, and I would write back. I would say, you know, that question is like saying, I'm going to buy a new suit. What size should I get? When I have no idea whether you're five foot six or six foot six, mm. it's a ridiculous question. You, um, there is no right answer that uniformly fits everybody. It's, it's just like every, you know, uh, different suits fit different people depending on what sizes they are. You know, so you have different trading approaches fit different people, and you can only find it by on your own. Nobody else can tell you what it is. Yeah. Okay, well, that kind of leads into this next question, which I think um, it's a, a beginner question, but I think it's an important one. Uh, it's from uh, Neha. Neha, apologies if I've mispronounced that. Um, 
Neha is a beginner in algo training, uh, algo trading, learning programming, uh, but has decent knowledge of technical analysis. Uh, the question is, if you had to recommend one trading guru whom I should religiously follow to be successful, whose material is available and is approachable, who would it be? I ask this question because in the process of teaching myself, I often suffer from the problem of information overload, um, which is a lot of times uh, contradictory as well. Okay, so my, my general advice is don't follow any guru. <laughs> Uh, but develop, you know, you've got to, you know, successful traders don't follow other people. They figure it out. They figure out what works for themselves. If you are a chart oriented trader, uh, I do have a friend who I, you know, has a long successful trading career who, unlike a lot of people in this business, you know, is, is real. You know, a lot of people in this business are really charlatans and who does have very, very solid views about trading and risk control and charts and, uh, combining charts and trading and that's peter brandt and he does have a publication called the factor so i kind of feel comfortable recommending him to those people for whom chart analysis and chart trading is the natural thing if it's not then i wouldn't, wouldn't recommend him either uh so he's somebody i think you can learn from and you still should kind of find your own approach but at least i can recommend him as a as a real you know a real trader with long-term success who has good solid concepts on risk management and who uh, does offer you know who does kind of tell people what he's trading and why uh and this publication is called the factor and his name is peter Brandt. so uh you know that's that uh, but uh you know and as far as other people i the only reason i know his stuff is because he's a friend and all that but i don't follow other people i don't read other people's stuff so people shouldn't take my not mentioning somebody else is indicating they're not good. I have no idea. I just don't look at anybody's stuff. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, Jack. Uh, a question from Glenn. In your experience, if you keep at it for long enough and listen to the right people, do, do you eventually become a successful trader? And by successful, I mean you can make a living from trading to put a roof over your head and clothe and feed your family. Answer is no. Um, uh, not everybody can be... Not everybody can earn a living as a, to be good enough as a trader, earn a living as a trader. No more than any, can anybody be uh, a professional musician uh, and earn a good living or being a professional musician or no more than anybody can be a uh, astrophysicist. You know, you, you, uh, you, you have to have a certain type, you have to have skills in that area. So um, ev everybody can improve by doing the right things in trading. And and I think I would even go so far as to saying most people can at least become net profitable by having enough knowledge and discipline and doing the right things. But I, I regardless of that, uh, only a, a, a certain small percentage of population that have the innate skills to be a, a good trader can do so. And doing so to earn a living makes it particularly diff more difficult. To, well, Peter Brandt, I mentioned, is actually a person. He's an example of somebody who's actually earned a living as a trader. But I couldn't do it. Uh, so the, the, the pressure of uh, of having to earn money, you know, earn enough in a living to, to pay for stuff like mortgage and your expenses – uh, that that's that's only you know not many people can do that and and it would, uh, I don't want to mislead people to think anybody can do it it's not true uh, so all all I could say is by doing the right things you can get better you might become that profitable some 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 may uh, may become extremely profitable do extremely well I met a lot of the hedge fund managers I interviewed over my years. Uh, did mention they read you know one of my marker wizards early in their career and and I'm interviewing them and they were they did very well so uh, that's you know and and sort of I interviewed lots of people you know uh, who are way better than I am and may have learned even from my books but that's because they have innate skill that I don't have so uh, again you have to have a certain amount of innate skill I will use one last analogy to make it crystal clear uh, take something like running a marathon. Uh, that the, running a marathon is difficult to do if you, if you haven't run. Obviously, it's impossible <laughs> to do. Uh, but yet, you know, even disabled people have successfully run marathons if they had the uh, the grit to do the uh, training and to to want to do it. Uh, and uh, you know, they they can do it. So if you really want to do it, you, uh, you know, almost almost anybody can eventually can run a marathon if they're willing to to, to devote themselves enough. But I don't care how much devotion and discipline you have. Only a tiny percentage of the population will ever be able to run 
uh, say, a, a, if a male, uh, say a 210 marathon or better, or a female, say a 230 marathon or better, uh, regardless of how hard they train, because uh, it's just not their physical makeup isn't such that their body can run at that speed, regardless of how devoted they are. So it's a combination of of knowledge and discipline and innate skill. Mm. Okay. Thanks, Jack. Now, uh, I want to switch topics to um, Fund Cedar in a minute, but if I can just ask you one final question on this. Um, What is the most common mistake that even experienced traders make? And that that question is from Christoph. Oh, experienced traders? Yeah. Um, I guess if experienced traders, I don't know if there's a common mistake that experienced traders make. I think experienced traders make varied mistakes. I don't know if there's a single common mistake that experienced traders make. Um, that's that's a difficult question. Um, so uh, that that's hard. I, I, for experienced traders, I'm not sure. Uh, for inexperienced traders, the most common mistake is uh, usually falls into some category of insufficient risk management. Uh, you know, letting one trade get away from them, uh, uh, focusing more on methodology than risk control, things of that nature. That's probably the most common mistake. Uh, Over trading, all, all these, all in fact, all the mistakes that, all the most common mistakes that that uh, novice traders make uh, fall into the big basket of some flaw in risk control. Yeah. Okay, now I just want to switch gears now to uh, Fundseeder. We've got a, a, quite a few questions here about Fundseeder, but before we get to those questions, perhaps you can uh, spend a moment to explain to us um, what is what is it. Okay, so Fundseeder, the concept behind Fundseeder, and uh, well, Fundseeder.com is the website, but the concept behind Fundseeder is that globally there's there's millions and millions of traders and most of these traders, even those that are very good, will never have an opportunity to manage money or to uh, to uh, reap the profits of their skill because yeah, they may be in countries where where there are no there's no real developed uh, financial market or uh, but for the most part though investors are only looking for traders with the proper uh, pedigree or connected with the right companies. So uh, th- our belief is that uh, there's just Lots and lots of skilled traders uh, worldwide that don't have the opportunity to be discovered, even if they're very good. So the idea of Fundseeder was to create a, a site where where traders and it doesn't have to be a good trade. I mean, any traders can go on, uh, link their accounts to to, to Fundseeder, and basically have their account tracked in real time on a daily basis. Uh, so what what Fundseeder does for um, for traders is two things. To, to, one, to attract traders, we've sort of built a platform that provides all sorts of analytics and um, graphs and tools for traders, and it's all free. And the reason we do that because we, we want to get as much mass. We want to become the go-to site for traders. So our our strategy is to give it away and just to get you know word of mouth and more and more traders using it. And it's, and, and it's not, not just because I helped develop it, uh, uh, but it is really a great platform. It does a lot of terrific things. So you can uh, you can plot your equity curve. You can do uh, all sorts of. You can get all sorts of statistics. You can uh, do you compare benchmarks to your equity curve. You can do you can look at underwater curves. You can uh, generate rolling rolling charts for for any indicator, return, volatility, sharp ratios, gain to pain ratio, et cetera, et cetera. It just in fact you could even do stuff like apply technical analysis. To your equity curve to see what would happen if, if when your equity curve, uh, using any of the number of technical systems we provide, uh, turns down and then turns up again, can you improve your performance by stopping trading when your equity curve starts to trend down? So there are all sorts of stuff on the site. So that's that's so it's uh, it does two things: it provides all those analytics and graphics, and uh, it also provides an opportunity for traders to get discovered. Uh, so Fundseeder itself does not actually. Uh, allocate or invest, but we have a sister company called Fundseeder Investments that uh, can that can use the Fundseeder uh, site to discover trading uh, uh, trading talent, and uh, that is the long term plan. So our goal was to create a a website, a central website, global website to democratize, uh, you know, democratize and globalize uh, the uh, the ability of traders to monetize their skill and to be found. 
Yep. Okay. All right. So um, let's jump to a couple of questions on Fund Cedar then. I've got quite a few here. So the first one's from Carlos. Um, what do you look for in terms of minimum performance metrics in order to invest in a candidate? Okay. So uh, what I basically look at, first of all, what I don't, I don't look at return at all. Uh, so return by itself, of course, the return is there for everybody. That, but uh, return by itself to me is a meaningless statistic. So all I, in terms of stats, all I ever personally look at are return to risk measures. Uh, Fundseeder has uh, its own proprietary complex measure called the Fundseeder score. That's one thing. I have my own my own uh, favorite simple measure that I developed years ago called the gain to pain ratio. That's another one of my favorites. But so I uh, those are the types of stats that uh, uh, that I'll look at. Um, also look at stuff like underwater charts uh, and uh, benchmark comparisons, etc. So th- those are. Uh, those are some of the things, and uh, I would also say that looking at performance is only the starting point. So, but to filter it, to be the beginning filter by looking for performance would be various return to risks type of of, of, of uh, uh, stats or charts that are actually anything that I would use is on uh, Fundseeder. And in fact, I developed it at the site. Uh, when I say I developed, I didn't do any of the programming. I just kind of designed what should be there. Yeah. Uh, but uh, what I what I asked our programmers to produce is exactly what I would like to see. Mm. Okay, a second question from Carlos. As a trader looking for investors, if my perform if my performance meets fund seed requirements, what is the correct capital amount I should be asking for when I don't know anything about my potential investors and their conditions? Um. So basically, your methodology uh, is going to be right for some minute. You're going to need some minimum account size to trade your methodology. So you need to know what your minimum account size is. Um, uh, basically, what would happen in the future is like Fund Cedar Investments, uh, when it's looking for allocations, either to fill a, a search for institutional investor or uh, if, if to, to create a uh, um, product. Uh, like a multi-manager fund. Again, I'm talking about fund seed investments here, which is a regulated entity. Uh, so at that point, uh, it will use the fund seeder uh, site to search for talent, and uh, and those traders that look that pop up, that you know uh, that look good, then there would be further work, you know, further discussions and what the approach is, better understand it, and so forth. Uh, but that's 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 a general process. The trader though needs to know what size account they need to trade. And I would also add that one of the things that Fundseeder does that I don't think exists elsewhere is that we allow traders to either use their net liquidating value as the base, which a net liquidating value is simply what is the account cash plus the mark-to-market value of all the existing positions. And that's what, you know, basically your account value. And that's the straightforward and normal approach. However, because for lots of derivative traders, they, they the money they keep uh, in the account is much less than uh, – Prudently should be in there if you know if that's what was being traded. For example, uh, if you're an FX trader and, and your broker requires you to keep one percent margin, and you put five percent, you have five percent margin, you know, money against your positions. That still would give you incredibly volatile results and may not. It would not be representative of what an investor should put in if you were trading that same amount of contracts or money, I should say. So. Uh, yeah, and traders can, instead of using a net liquidating value, define what their nominal account size is. So, a, a trader might have uh, an FX trader might have fifty thousand dollars in the account, but trading it like it was five hundred thousand dollars. So, that that trader would not choose net liquidating value five of the fifty, uh, which would be fifty. They would choose five hundred thousand dollars, and therefore their results, every return they made, would be cut by a tenth. But so would every loss. Uh, the, of course, that wouldn't affect the return or risk, but it would make the uh, the the equity result the equity curve results and the statistics uh, represent what would uh, what would be representative for a, an investor who would be allocating to that trader. So every trader needs to define what is the account size uh, to trade the way I'm trading, and it's not always just going to be the money in the account. For many derivative traders, like I say, it's going to be a greater amount, and they would then define that as their nominal account size. Yep. Okay. Uh, a question from Nikhil. Any plans to open up Fund Cedar for Indian markets with Indian brokers so that Indian traders can participate to increase their visibility? 
Yeah, we've had a number of requests for from Indian traders, and we we do we we'll have I know we we have discussions ongoing. Some I haven't had them, but I know so one of my colleagues have had discussions with a huge Indian Indian brokerage firm. So I think that may happen. That may well happen. Uh, I don't, can't give you any horizon on it, but I would say for now is that. Um, if your broker is not linkable to uh, Fundseeder, no problem at all. Uh, we've set it up so you can still create an unverified account. Uh, an unverified account means that you upload the numbers uh, instead of our getting it directly from the broker. But all the analytics uh, that you can use and everything else is exactly the same. So you can still get the benefit of the site. And I would also add that we will be – when we do searches, we will also look at unverified accounts, of course – we would have to verify it, uh, obviously, but uh, you know we're, we're going to basically make the assumption that there's no point in people uh, putting up fictitious numbers because they know we're going to verify it one way or the other. Uh, so we would not, really, and we understand that a lot of traders are only using unverified accounts because their broker is not linkable. So, for example, anybody in India at this point. So what you can do is uh, if you go uh, and uh, do the setup, setting up the account process, you'll be asked for your broker, and it'll say if your broker is not in, uh, you can choose an, uh, an XLS, Excel uh, uh, upload, and it's simply you, you hit that, you'll get a, a template, and it's a simple matter of just cutting and pasting, uh, filling in a couple of, uh, you know, indicating whether you include weekends or not, indicating your start date, then you doing cut and paste from an Excel sheet, dropping the numbers in, and then boom, you've got an account that'll be showing up. And yes, you have to manually update it, but uh, but you will still get all the same analytics, and you still appear uh, uh, as a searchable uh, account. Okay, thanks, Jack. Now a question from uh, Francisco: What are the best traders in the Fund Cedar project doing differently, and what is working best? Okay, so that I can't answer yet because we've uh, we've spent the initial years of this project really developing. In fact, we still have a lot more development. Uh, we've got a lot of other tools we're going to be adding. So uh, it's been an immense project. We were largely, we, we started out self-funded, uh, the partners. And so only now we're starting to, to doing some outside. Uh, we had a little bit of outside money. We took a, a very small amount, but we're doing our first meaningful raise right now. Uh, so we focused on the trader side, the trader side, the investor side, we have not yet. Uh, we've that's that's what we're going to be doing in this next phase, and so uh, uh, we, I can't answer the question because uh, I have not yet done the uh, the uh, uh, the task of going through. I mean, I've looked at names, I've looked at people, I mean, all that, but I haven't gotten to the point where of matching people for all allocations and stuff like that, doing the search and talking to people. And I'm waiting to do that until we actually are, are matching the money. Uh, we've had a couple of allocations that have occurred from investor, from fund seeder investments, but that's just been sort of about even that site being fully developed. It's not yet been our thrust. It's going to become uh, a major uh, element of our uh of our project in the next year. Uh, so uh, so uh, a year from now, I can probably answer that question, mm. but now I can't. Yep. Okay, cool. Uh, now a question from Simon. Um, for those traders who are looking to start a fund or individually managed accounts, what can you share on the regulatory, technological or compliance issues? And what do you know about if it's easier to do it in certain jurisdictions or to only manage non-US clients? Now, I should mention, actually, that Simon is from Australia, so that might uh, put a different spin right. on the answer. But. Well, what, one, of the, one of the three founding partners is James Bibbings, who runs a uh, company called Turnkey, which is basically a company uh, that deals with regulatory compliance, uh, 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 setting, up a, setting, setting up managed businesses and so forth. And uh, since he's, he's part of uh, Fundseeder, uh, kind of can do these things very cost effectively. So I would suggest anybody's interested in that. Uh, so, and in fact, on the site you can you can just uh, send a, an inquiry. Um, if you go to FAQs, you'll see probably questions that deal exactly with that, and you'll see a link where you can just uh, uh, provide an inquiry. You can get a free kind of consultation uh, to what your situation is, or what and what's recommended, or what might be needed. Uh, uh, we do recommend people be regulated. Uh, ultimately, when on the for the for the fund seeder investment site, when that's fully uh, developed, uh, we will only migrate uh, regulated traders to that for regulatory reasons. Uh, so it is a good idea, uh, but you can get some free advice and uh, 
and uh, very cost-effective solutions uh, uh, via my partner, James Bibbings. Yep, okay. And uh, final question on Funseeder from Toby. Will Jack be selecting traders from Funseeder to feature in an Undiscovered Market Wizard book? And if so, what will be the selection criteria? Okay, so yeah, so that that is the plan. Uh, and I'm going to drag my feet by a couple of years here because I want people to develop records and I want to get a larger a larger and larger database. Uh, I kind of think that uh, Funseeder over the next couple of years will probably grow, begin to grow dramatically. I mean, there are, I've got, the last time I checked months ago, there were over 5,000 people, but I'm really talking about really getting very large numbers. So uh, I, I'm going to be delaying that, like I say, just to get longer track records and more people to be participant. But I kind of picture that a couple of years out, and this has been the plan from the very beginning, to do a book called Undiscovered Market Wizards. And the criteria will be, again, return risk and, and length of track record. So, I mean, somebody can have a great return risk for one year. It's not going to give me material to do a track record. So I have to do a uh, to do an interview. So I have to uh, – I will need to be looking for people who have been doing it for some time and have really very, very good return to risk numbers. And, um, and then – uh, I imagine there'll be quite a number of people that fulfill those conditions uh, a couple of years out from now, and then it'll be a matter of doing some preliminary calls and follow-ups and kind of narrowing it down. But yes, there is a plan. Uh, my plan is that the next Market Wizard book will, in fact, be titled Undiscovered Market Wizards and will use its sourcing, uh, uh, will use this site for its sourcing. Yeah, Awesome. All right, thanks, Jack. Now, I'm conscious of our time, but uh, I'd just like to ask you a few more questions about sure, yeah. uh, trading strategy because uh, we've got some really interesting ones here. So, uh, first of all, um, a question from uh, another question from Nikhil, actually. Do you think that the quantitative automated approach is a crowded strategy being adopted by the masses? Uh, no, um, because there are just, well, I, I was going to say trillions, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's really there is no way of putting a number on it. Even that might be an understatement. There's no end to the variations you can use in a quantitative, or for that matter, a discretionary approach. The, it, it just uh, there could be doesn't matter how many people are doing it. You can always come up with some way that's different and come up with some uh, uh, some variation. Now, uh, I, I can think of traders I interviewed who use quant like one of the maybe the most successful well not maybe the one of the most successful quants and certainly one of the most phenomenal. Uh, uh, track records I've, uh, I've ever encountered is uh, is Ed Thorpe, uh, who's a pure quant guy, you know, PhD mathematician, uh, uh, would have been a PhD physicist as well if he ever bothered to write his thesis. Uh, but uh, so he he kind of uh, all through his career kept on developing new quantitative strategies, and and every time he was the first person to uh, use convertible arbitrage, statistical arbitrage, et cetera, et cetera. But each time each one became more crowded, he sort of shifted to something else. And even within a certain strategy like statistical arbitrage, he started out with a basic version, then changed that, then changed that. So he kept on evolving. So there's always uh, there may can be, there can be lots and lots of people doing it. It doesn't mean that it's crowded because they're all doing it in different ways. Mm, yeah. Okay. A question from David: If AI already beats the best chess players and poker players in the world, is there any hope for independent human traders in the future? Uh, yeah, it's. Um, there's a difference between something like I'll take something like chess versus something like the markets, right? So, so there was a time where people, you know, thought, well, you know, uh, I, computers will never beat a master in chess, and of course now, now the best chess players in the world can't beat a computer. Um, I mean, a, a computer with sufficient power and the right program. So, uh, but that, but uh, even though I mean, chess has just like phenomenal number of combinations, uh, computer power has gotten so incredible that it can solve it. But there's a big difference between between markets and something like chess. First of all, the combinations are even are much more, you know, much greater with markets than they are with, with chess. But besides that, the difference is in chess, you know, the knight always moves in the same way. <laughs> there's always 64 squares. You know, there, certain things are well defined and don't change, you know. Uh, the you know uh, so the, the rules are extremely well defined. In markets, things are always changing because humans are changing, and 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 certain factors become important at one time and unimportant at other times. And it's just, uh, it's not only tremendously more complex in the number of variations; it's also each of the elements is constantly varying. So it becomes a type of problem where uh, a skilled 
the skilled uh, player we don't tr- call a trader still has the opportunity even if they're even if he's competing against massively uh, powerful uh, uh, programs so I think there's a difference there and maybe at some point we'll get to the point where AI uh, where it's all AI and and uh, you just have different AI programs trading against each other but I think that's that's still quite a ways off and uh, for people who are trading now, I think in their lifetime, it's still uh, humans still have a spot. Yeah, but what about a, a lot of the uh, techniques, like the machine learning techniques that are, are being used now? Do you think that's going to accelerate the um, the decline of a lot of the edges that we have today? Well, it's good. Cha- you know, it may change markets, but clever traders will figure out will figure out ways to 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 take advantage that may that may cause market behaviors. T- other inefficiencies to evolve and that clever traders uh, will will pick up on. So, uh, and, and also AI, I mean, AI is very, again, it's AI, it's different for something where the stable relationships uh, versus something where the relationships are very unstable. The fact that market relationships are so unstable and changing makes it, I think, much, much more difficult. And there is a, uh, there's also a danger in AI uh, of of hindsight, you know, of hindsight learning, you know, if it, you know, what worked in the past, but things change. Uh, so, like I say, there there's much less stability in market behavior from period to period than there are in other things that AI is applied to. So, uh, I think it makes it mo- uh, less of a uh, an area where where AI is likely to totally dominate. Although, if you give it enough time. Who knows? It it may get to the point where, like I say, AI is better than human computer than than all human traders, but I don't think yet. Mm, yeah. uh, a question from Laurent. Jack said that he believes markets somewhere have the thumbprint of human emotions. How would he go about uncovering this thumbprint? Well, I mean, markets are you know uh, markets embed everything that anybody's doing in in the market. So insofar as uh, as all non-systematic traders are operating on some – have some emotional uh, – well, maybe not all, but a lot of them have some emotional part of their decision process, you'll see it reflected in prices. Uh, so uh, it's it's kind of a um, – it, it's a tautology to an extent, right? That's uh, – by definition – Market prices reflect emotions uh, to a significant extent. Now, what does change is how large uh, a part emotions uh, play. So, if you get into bubble and panics, at that point, it's it's almost all emotions and everything else, uh, and everything else is out the window. At other times, it you know could be major fundamental trends uh, that are dominating. But uh, human emotions are there all the time. Uh, their, their prominence will vary based upon the market phase. Yeah, okay. A uh, question from Jeffrey. If you had a system that was profitable in trending stock markets but had more markets available than your money allowed you to trade in, how would you select which markets to focus on and why? Okay, that's a pretty good question. Right, so uh, you would want to diversify as much as possible, but you've got a limited amount of money. Uh, first of all, diversification... Uh, Here's an important point. Diversification is not the more elements you have, the more diversification you have. You have to take into account the degree of correlation between your elements. So you could have you can have a 10 stock portfolio that is way more diversified than a hundred stock portfolio. So uh, given your uh, uh, your uh, listener's question, the answer would be is to find a, a subset of stocks that are most uncorrelated. Uh, and well, first of all, you got to define a subset of stocks where that you believe your system or approach works for that you want to trade. But once you have that, uh, let's say you know you can look, make up numbers here. Say you have a hundred stocks that you that is in your potential universe that you might trade if you had enough money, but you only have enough money for ten. Well, uh, then pick uh, and there's no preference between which of those hundred. Then pick the ten that that give you that have the least correlation with each other. And that's simply a, a mathematical uh, – that's simply a correlation matrix uh, analysis. So that's the way I would do it. I would pick the least diversified uh, stocks. And uh, also, if you're trading stocks, uh, nobody says you have to trade a 1,000 shares of stocks. You could trade uh, 
you know, you could trade uh, smaller numbers of stocks and uh, uh, you can get more diversification by just trading smaller, small amount of shares, even if it's odd lots. Uh, it may still be worthwhile to do that. Uh, now, this question is from unknown. I don't have a name for this one. So apologies to whoever submitted this one. What do you believe will be the most important changes to trading in both corporate and retail arenas in the next 20 years? I don't think I have anything to say on that because I'm not in the prediction business. Mm. You don't have a crystal ball? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> and if I did, I would use it. Okay. All right. Now, um, back to a question from Christoph. In your opinion, what are the most important hard factors of a successful trading strategy and why? And he gives the example, entry, exit, risk management, position sizing, etc. Right. Okay. So the most important element is risk management. That's easy. Um, a second most important thing to consider is that uh, trading is not simply a static process. And by that, I mean it's not simply a matter of you decide where you get in and you decide where you get out. You Nobody said that's that it has to be done that way. Uh, you can also – you can treat it as a dynamic process, meaning you get in and along the way – you may decide to get partially out and to get partially back in and all that. And strategies that, that don't get all in and get all out at the same one point are, I think, inherently more, more powerful, uh, have a better opportunity for better return risk than strategies which are just uh, 100% in on the buy point, 100% out on the sell point. So I would say the one thing to think about is uh, making the process dynamic. You know, you, you get in here – uh, but here may not be one point. There may be a scaling process, and the same for getting out. Yeah. So if you're looking at uh, pyramiding or scaling in and out of a, um, a position, what kind of uh, it changes the risk profile a little bit? So what kind of considerations do you need to make when you when you're looking at an approach like that? Well, if you're first of all, pyramiding is is, is a dangerous thing. So I, I I don't like the idea of just pyramiding. Uh, uh, you know, just adding positions and having similar. Uh, uh, risks on the entire position. I think where pyramiding makes sense, and I do make this point, uh, I don't know if you read that particular chapter, but I do have an example where, uh, of how to, you know, in fact, that I do have that people can actually find this particular point. I do have a blog on LinkedIn, and they can find actually my most recent blog posting, which is uh, based on an excerpt from, from the Complete Guide of Futures, uh, talks about mid-trend entry. And in there, uh, is is this idea that um, that you you know you can have a good approach and and get a massive trend, but if all you have is your initial position, you're not exploiting it fully. But you can get more mileage out of it by the fact by using the fact that every trend has corrections. And so in there, I give some examples of how you can get a correction and define what a correction is, define what a resumption of a trend is, and then get in. But when you get in, then you have a similarly close stop as you had on your initial trade. So what you're doing is a completely new trade. It's still on – it's in fact maybe doubling your position, but it's like an entirely new trade and it's still keeping a risk as small as you would have had on the original position. The danger in permitting is if you add positions and now have a much wider risk because uh, – you know, you're putting the risk where your your original stop, say, is on the position that was uh, placed at a much more beneficial price. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you just touched on uh, diversification a little bit earlier. I've got a question here from David um, asking, when diversifying across strategies and markets, how much diversification is, and this is in quotes, enough? Um, okay, so I'm a believer in more diversification is better. Uh my my point is you diversify as far as you can, uh, subject to the fact that what you're adding isn't inferior to what you have in. You know, so let's say hypothetically um, you had uh, um, I don't know uh, tw twenty different systems you could trade or whatever, uh, and by diversifying <coughs> diversifying across the multiple systems you did better. So as if all the systems were were uh, equally good as long as the system provided more diversification. Um, it means it has to be uncorrelated with the systems that are already there. You would add it as long as you had the money to trade. So bottom line is I think as long as you're not reducing your expected gain, uh, then adding 
diversification is always wise. And mathematically, actually, you can add diversification, even if it reduces your return, it might still be worthwhile because it can reduce your risk more. And all you need to do then is to just use leverage to go back to your original risk and you'll have more gain. So bottom line, it's all a matter of return to risk. And I guess the answer is diversify, continue to diversify as long as it improves the return to risk. Yeah. Now, we've got a couple of questions here on trend following. I won't go through them all, but I think uh, I recommend if people want to know some more uh, about trend following, they should take a look at your futures book because you've got an interesting section in there about um, some of the challenges of trend following and um, some uh, techniques to kind of address those. But I just want to ask this one here from um, Jan or, or maybe it's Jan. Does Jack believe that trend following based on a simple set of rules still has a chance to generate decent returns in liquid markets? Okay, so um, there was a day, there was a time back in the early in the early 70s, late, you know, actually the entire 70s, I wouldn't even say the early 70s, the entire 70s, maybe even the early 80s, where trend following worked extremely well. Uh, and some of the traders I interviewed did uh, – did really take advantage of that and made massive, you know, massive, ma I'm talking like thousand percent a year sometimes of returns. Uh, so that type of opportunity just, uh, well, of course, they were great traders to, to, to know how to take advantage of that as well. But uh, uh, but, the, but the market does not provide those opportunities anymore. And once uh, once trend following became really popularized, standard trend following approaches uh, certainly don't perform anything like they used to. Um, so, uh, however, I, having said that, I also believe that there are inherently trends in the market for fundamental reasons. For example, uh, take currencies or interest rates. There are reasons why currencies and interest rates would have trends, fundamental reasons. Namely, central banks will decide on a policy. If a central bank decides it's going to weaken its currency or strengthen, it doesn't make a difference, or raise its interest rates or lower it. It doesn't decide to do that uh, on Friday and the next Tuesday, uh, you know, reverse its opinion. It usually makes those decisions for like multiple years. It's like a long-term policy. So there are reasons why uh, trends would tend to persist. What's changed is the trends have gotten much choppier and much more likely to, to knock out trend followers. So the, the lesson is, yes, trend following still has a fundamental reason for working. Yes, on balance, it probably will still produce net positive returns, but the ride has gotten a lot choppier. And the answer whether the, it's still tradable or to how tradable is a matter of just testing the particular method you're looking to use and see how it would have done. Again, with testing without hindsight along the lines of what we discussed earlier in this uh, podcast. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. All right. I think I might just ask one more question from this audience list before we uh, start wrapping sure. up. So this one is from uh, Ev Juini or Eugenie. I'm, I'm sure I've got that wrong. But anyway, uh, is it worth spending time on trying different strategies or are we better to stick with a limited number of strategies, but working on refining them, fine tuning indicators, uh, seasonalities, money management, etc.? Well, I, I think you, you, you stick with anything that's working. Um, but you should always, you can just make sense to always be looking for, for new things to the, that might work. And if no other reason to provide diversification, uh, the mistake only is if you have stuff that works and have some other stuff that doesn't work and traders do this, they'll insist on doing stuff that doesn't work, even though they have stuff that works. So that's not good, but looking for other stuff that works and that, that, does that still make sense? That's part of a research process. And who knows what's working for you now may stop working at some other point. So it's always good to not have, you know, use a cliche, all the eggs in one basket. So I'm uh, sorry to use a cliche, but, <laughs> uh, but, but that's kind of true. You don't, if you only have one methodology and it uh, stops working, you're kind of stuck. So it's good to have some variation and it's good to still do research, but don't fall into the trap of, uh, of continuing to, Try to make something work that's not working. If it's not working, don't do it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. All right, Jack. Well, I'm very conscious of our time. We've uh, gone well over and uh, you've been extremely generous to stay on and uh, answer some of these questions. So thank you very much for that. Sure, and Andrew. And like I say, uh, uh, yeah. And let me know when you uh, do post it with the link and all that. And I, I can retweet the link and all. Okay, well, it's not over yet. I want to wrap up with a few quick closing questions. So. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> um, first one, what's the biggest lesson you've learned through trading? 
The biggest lesson I've learned, okay, uh, well, uh, I guess I, and it comes from this uh, number trader who said it, but the one who said it maybe most succinctly and directly was that uh, was uh, Bruce Kovner, and that is uh, know where you're getting out before you get in. Uh, so I think that is a tremendous uh, piece of useful advice, and uh, that's one of the main things I learned from doing the Mark Wizard books. And why that's so good is because it takes a lot of emotionality out of trading because you have complete objectivity before you get into position and you have no objectivity once you're into a position. So mm. it makes sense to decide your exit plan before you get in. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what's your favorite trading books? Okay. So uh, I would say probably the best trading book uh, would be Reminiscences of a Stock Operator, uh, which is a book written in the 20s. Uh, uh, it's about Jesse Livermore, not by Jesse Livermore, but it's it's written from his perspective, and the the, the writer did such a good job of doing of 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 narrating his perspective as a trader uh, that that back in the days when I read it, uh, when the book was sixty five years old, uh, people actually some people thought it was Jesse Livermore using a pseudonym, but it wasn't. Uh, the, the author Edwin Lefevre was a was an author and a journalist and. Uh, uh, so, uh, anyway, the reminiscences about the stock copy. It's also the book most mentioned by people I interviewed as, as a book that influenced them. Uh, so that's the one book I would also mention, uh, Nassim Talib has written a number of, uh, wise books about markets. Uh, yeah. although he wouldn't cite it as his best book. My favorite book that he did was his first, I believe it was his first book fooled by randomness and not so much for techniques or anything like that, but for its philosophy about the role uh, of luck in markets and uh, and uh, the difference between luck and skill and uh, and an understanding of tails and risk and all of that stuff, I think that is a classic book. Uh, if I had to bet on a book that'll be around a hundred years from now, uh, that's good. that would be one of them. Yep, that and Market Wizards, I think. <laughs> and well, uh, I hope that's true. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's still it's still chugging along pretty strongly after thirty uh, years or so. So. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I told my kids they'll probably still get royalties on it when I'm gone. Yeah, I think the lessons in there are timeless. I don't see why I wouldn't be around for a lot longer. Okay, and uh, final question then. What's the best way for listeners to um, get more from you? Okay, so uh, I basically, first of all, the site, as you mentioned, uh, the company site is funseater.com. Yep. Uh, and as far as me, I also have my own website, which I don't do much with. I so I do I do put uh, podcasts and stuff like that and on it, uh, updated that way. But I've just got just my name, jackschwager.com. Okay, awesome. I'll have links to those on the show notes so that people can find those easily. All right, well, thank you very much for your time today, Jack. You've been very sure, generous Andrew. to, um, to uh, spend time with us today. Is there anything else that you'd like to mention before we finish up? No, we've really uh, – I think we've, we've covered the <laughs> gamut here, so yeah. – uh, I think that's good. All right. Well, thanks again for spending time with us. I think I can say on behalf of most traders out there, thanks for everything that you've uh, contributed to the trading community over the years. I think you've had a really huge impact in the lives of many traders along their journey. So thank you uh, very much for that. And uh, I wish you all the best. Hey, thank you very much. Thanks, Jack. Take care. Cheers, mate. Bye-bye. Bye. So a huge thanks to Jack for chatting with us for this one and spending so much time answering all of our trading questions. Now, as I mentioned at the start of this episode, we've organized something really huge to celebrate this special 100th podcast episode. And what we've organized for this one is in conjunction with our education partner, Better Trader Academy. Now, some of you may already know that I formed Better Trader Academy with a few other traders last year to, to kind of extend the educational content of this podcast into more structured learning. And over the past 12 months or so, we've created and released a number of high value trading courses on a range of different topics from beginner to advanced. And so to celebrate this 100th episode milestone, we've put together a huge giveaway package worth almost $20,000. That's right, 20 grand. Now, this giveaway contains five higher value training programs plus a number of um, high end bonuses as well. In fact, two of the programs have never been released to the public before. They're accessible by private invitation only. So, this prize really is exclusive. And one lucky trader is going to win the lot. Now, there's too much on offer for me to mention here, so I think the best thing for you to do is to go to bettersystemtrader.com slash 100, and you will see a link to the giveaway page there, which has all the details on what's included in the prize package, plus 
importantly, how to enter. <laughs> so that page was bettersystemtrader.com slash 100. Go check it out and good luck. That winner could be you. Oh, I nearly forgot to mention as well that it's only open until Friday, June 16th. So that's just a few days. Make sure you get in fast and you don't forget. And if you're on the Better System Trader mailing list, I'll send you a reminder email during the week because I don't want people to miss out. So good luck and thanks again for joining me for this Milestone 100th episode. And I'll catch you again very soon. Thanks for listening to Better System Trader. Okay, well, that's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. Come on over to bettersystemtrader.com. That's where you'll find all the previous episodes, all the transcribes, all the show notes, and all the free weekly trading tips. bettersystemtrader.com. Bettersystemtrader.com.